Well, good evening, everyone. It's just 7.30, so we're going to make a start. My name is Alison Woodrow, and I'm the Engagement Support Lead at EMF, and I am delighted to welcome you this evening to another one of our webinars. It's just wonderful to see the continued interest and support that you all show for these online events, and we really do appreciate it very much. We pray that this evening you will find um, this webinar to be informative, encouraging, hopefully even exciting as we think about the work of God throughout Europe. Just a little reminder, we do record all of our webinars. So if you want to look at some of our previous events, you can do so on our website. But tonight's topic is the training of gospel workers in Europe. Europe is a vast mission field, as we all know, which needs thousands more gospel workers. So this evening, we want to help you explore the vital role of appropriate training for the gospel workers of today and tomorrow pastors, church planters, etc. We want to give an overview of some of the many training opportunities that are on offer today. And we want to encourage you as Christians and churches to understand the importance of training for gospel workers and to support that training with your prayers and your financial help. But before we dive in, let me welcome and introduce our panel of contributors. So firstly, we're delighted to have Bill James with us. Bill has been Principal of London Seminary for the last six years, having previously been a pastor for 26 years. He is married to Sharon with grown-up children. London Seminary is an evangelical residential seminary providing theological training for pastors and preachers with a distinctive em emphasis on pastors training pastors. Um, Bill is also a member of the FIEC Trust Board. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, Bill. Next up, we welcome Dr. Clive Boucher. Clive is Provost and Director of Mission at Union School of Theology in Wales, joining the ministry there about two years ago. He lives on the South Wales coast with his wife, Kirsten, and son, Alistair. He has extensive pastoral and academic experience and has authored two books on the wonderful topic of union with Christ. Union School of Theology is based in Wales, but has learning communities across the world and offers flexible routes to study. At Union, Clive teaches both New Testament and Biblical theology and is encouraged recently to have been appointed as an elder in his local church. It's great to have you with us, Clive. Thank you. And then we come to our very own missionaries. Firstly, we have uh, Diego Lopes. Diego is Brazilian, but is joining us from Portugal, where he leads a young church just south of Lisbon. Diego and his wife, Stella, have many years experience in planting and leading churches across several continents but returned to Stella's native Portugal in 2018, where they now live with their three young children. In addition to his church work, Diego is executive coordinator of the Martin Bootser Seminary in Portugal. He is thrilled that the seminary is currently, in his own words, blossoming, nurturing over 20 students. And he says it's particularly heartening to see these students actively contributing to their local churches right across Portugal. And last but not least, we have Paul Borzaji. Paul is pastor of the Hungarian Church at Periche in the region of Transylvania, Romania. And in addition to these pastoral duties, he lectures in the Hungarian Baptist Seminary and in weekend Bible schools. He's married to Anna and they have three children. And he says his greatest joy in his work is preaching. So thank you to both of you for being here also. And Andrew Birch, who of course is a familiar face to most, if not all of you, will chair this discussion. Andrew is the current EMF director. So thank you, Andrew. Thank you all of, all of you for joining with us this evening. We're really looking forward to hearing from you in just a moment or two. Now, the format of this evening is hopefully simple and straightforward. We're going to open in prayer and then I'm going to hand straight over to Andrew for the panel, which will take around half an hour or so. And then immediately after that, we're going to have a 15 minute question and answer session when you'll get to interact and engage with our panel. Then we'll have a few announcements and then there'll be an additional 30 minute session for some more informal Q&A and a time of prayer. The process for asking questions is easy. So have a look at the slide, uh, which you should see hopefully now. On most screens, all you have to do is click on the chat icon and type in your question and send it to Martin Tatham. You should see Martin's name at the very top of the list. If you don't see a chat icon, you may need to click on more than chat before sending your question. 
Martin will collate all the questions and put them to the panel and it's as easy as that. So please do feel free to send any questions you have right from the start and that will help us to have a really useful Q&A time. But before we do any of that, we're going to take a moment to pause and to seek the Lord's help for the evening. And I'm going to ask Ken Patterson, who is a former EMF trustee, if he'll open in prayer for us. Thank you. Well, let's bow together now for a short moment of prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we want to bow humbly before you now and seek your grace at the time, this uh, start of our time together this evening. We come as sinners, redeemed through the precious blood of Christ, but still sinning so often in thought and word and deed. But we thank you that you are a gracious God and that you delight in mercy and that we have a saviour and mediator, the Lord Jesus, who is full of grace and truth and that the gospel is a gospel of grace from beginning to end. So cleanse us from every sin, we pray. And help us now as we turn our thoughts to the needy continent of Europe. We remember that Jesus told his disciples to pray for laborers to be sent into the harvest field. So we pray that you would call many more into gospel work in Europe and equip them to rightly handle the word of truth. Richly bless those faithful seminary teachers already involved in training new gospel workers and add many more to their number, and help us now as we think of these things. Bless those who speak tonight. Use them to stimulate our thinking, and grant that all that is said and done will be for your honour and glory. We pray this in the lovely name of our Saviour Jesus. Amen. 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 So over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Ali. Uh, and thanks to our guests, uh, Bill, Clive, Diego and Paul, uh, for being with us. Uh, thanks for being willing to help us to think about training this evening, the training of pastors and other gospel workers. So, Clive, if I can start with you, uh, what do we mean by training? Uh, who needs it and why? Well, training is a word maybe that would appeal a bit more immediately if you're into sport than into something like like music or the arts perhaps but but really we're talking about development um the the development growth and formation of gospel workers and that's a process which includes theological formation i think spiritual formation and practical equipping as well uh, most people, whether you're going off to, to plant a church or to pastor or to do some other kind of ministry, I think need an, an intensive period of training as they set out in gospel ministry and mission. Uh, but training is a process that's ongoing, isn't it? Um, it's, a, it's a process that we uh, won't complete this side of, of, of glory. We're always growing in Christ. Um, and we all need training of different kinds at, at, at various times. We're not individual islands. We're part of the body of Christ. And this is part of how how we grow. Great. Thanks. Anything to add, uh, Bill, Diego or Pal? OK, Bill, if I can come to you then, uh, what's the biblical basis? Uh, we want to be biblical. So what's the biblical basis for the training of gospel workers? Uh, and where does the Bible teach or maybe imply uh, that pastors and other gospel workers need training? Yeah, well, if, if you if you look at the New Testament uh, in search of a seminary or a Bible college, uh, you will sadly be disappointed. Uh, but still, there is clearly uh, some training going on. Um, if you think of the apostles, uh, for example, they were living with the Lord Jesus Christ uh, throughout his earthly ministry. Uh, so they heard his teaching, uh, they witnessed his ministry, uh, they saw the example of his life. And indeed, the Lord Jesus gave them ministry experience. He sent them out to preach. Uh, he involved them very much um, in his ministry. And then in the time of the apostles, it seems the apostles adopted a, a similar model of training. So, for example, Paul and Barnabas took John Mark uh, with them on their first missionary journey. And then Paul took Timothy later on, who became the pastor of the church in, in, in Ephesus. 
So we, we, we can assume that just as Paul had been trained by uh, Gamaliel, so he used similar training methods for his for his own apprentices. And then and then we read that in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, there was some sort of plan or program to pass down the deposit of the gospel uh, from one generation to the next in terms of preachers and teachers and leaders of the church. So that's that's broadly the the the, the biblical basis. Obviously, that developed later on in the in the early church and into church history. But but the important biblical principle is that the the training for the apostles and the apostles apprentices was a balance. It was a balance of content, experience, uh, ministry experience and also personal example from other older, more senior uh, leaders and and w- when you when you look at the history um, of of theological training uh, in the church, there's always a tendency to veer to one of the extremes. Either either you end up becoming very academic and abstruse and remote with you know theological abstractions, mm. or you veer towards uh, very sort of pietistic and practical and spiritual and very thin on content. And, and the point is that we need all the elements. Together, we we need a very rigorous training, but we also need a very uh, strong emphasis on practical ministry and spiritual development. And the destination is is always to be equipped for ministry. Great, thanks. Any of you brothers want to add anything to that? Okay, feel free, all of you, to chip in uh, after each one of you has spoken. Diego, if I can come to you. And now you, as well as being a pastor, Diego, are involved in the Martin Buser Seminary in Portugal. That's a very young seminary, as I understand it, only in its second year. Uh, Can you tell us how that dream uh, became a reality? Well, um, this dream started about 11 years ago when two pastors here from Lisbon uh, thought, you know, we needed training in Lisbon that would reach the necessities of our Portuguese context. So they start planning for that. You know, they sent one of our guys, which is Tiago Oliveira, to port to the US to study. At the time I was in Canada. Afterwards, about six years ago, they invited me to join the team as well. And I came back and we started developing a program that would meet the needs of our very peculiar context here in the corner of our continent. And um and three churches, four churches now came together uh, and we made partnership with people from overseas as well, the US and other places. Uh, and we started two years ago. So it's a lot of work from the ha- receiving help from a lot of people from different countries, but also, you know, local churches involved in creating a seminary that would meet the needs of our churches in our context. How many students, Diego, do you have at the moment? At the moment, well, um, we, we have about 25. Right. Uh, we have more candidates as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of our pride, well, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about, we have 22 students in Greek. So <laughs> it's a major development for our country. Yeah. It's reason to celebrate as well. So, yeah, we, we, we have um, people coming from the north to the south of Portugal. Um and it's about 22 students right now. And Diego, tell me, would you say that different kinds of gospel work, whether it's pastoring or church planting or evangelism or whatever, would you say that different kinds of work require different kinds of training or different levels of training, maybe? Yeah, we would say different levels levels of training. Uh, what happens in our seminary is that we have three levels of training. Although we are focused on training pastors, that's our main uh, objective. Right. Uh, but we also understand that sometimes, you know, in the churches, especially traveling in our country, we see that there are, there is a need for theological training for Sunday school teachers, for deacons, for other people that need training as well. However, uh, because they're not training for pastoral ministry, they won't have the same requirements but they also need to understand uh, and to have a contact with the theology that would help the local church. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's what we do. We have a basic training as well, uh, intermediate training, but our main focus is ministry training, training that we call advanced training, mm-hmm. advanced theological training. 
Great, thank you. Uh, Pal, if I can come to you, um, and this is quite a broad question, so I hope you're comfortable with it. Uh, what subjects or areas do you think should be included in any well-rounded training for gospel work? Regarding the subjects, um, well, there are many subjects. We can uh, categorize them, and uh, there are certain subjects that pertain to the text, how to interpret the Bible overall, how to ex exegete concrete text, whether it relates to the Old Testament, Hebrew, or New Testament, Greek, or uh, uh, so we would pertain some subject to those areas. Others would cover or would be brought together under the umbrella of, of uh, biblical studies, uh, how to and understand the Old Testament or the New Testament. And in this case, the so-called biblical theology comes into a, a picture, which nowadays uh, is very strong anywhere around the world at any seminary. Uh, formerly, it was regarded that the systematic theology uh, was the queen of theological subjects. Mm -hmm. And now biblical theology is so strong. Uh, still, we would say that uh, systematic theology is very, very important. So how to put together the faith, how to understand, how to uh, formulate what the Bible says regarding a certain subject today, what we believe about certain subject. And that, that pertains to the systematic theology. Moreover, we have to cover also the pastoral uh, issues, how to preach the text how to counsel others um, and uh, and things like that. Regarding church history, I would be, I would emphasize very strongly we have to understand church history. Uh, if we, it depends how much time we have in during the, during the course of the studies. Is it a one or two year study? Is it a four years full study? Uh, full time, then we have to emphasize if it is a shorter study or a shorter course, we have to emphasize, I would say, early church history, reformation period, and modern, modern church history. If we have more time, we can delve into more details. Uh, I would also add, it would be very important to study apologetics, world religions, or regarding or depending where is the seminary or the Bible school and for whom they are trying to train workers, the context, the context. Is it a Roman Catholic context? Is it a, a, a Muslim context? Is it a more secular context? Mm -hmm. Then depending on that background, we would introduce other subjects that pertain to their own uh, situation. So that's how I would uh, uh, put together a curriculum for a uh, for a uh, training course. Great. Um, a couple of you have already mentioned the original languages. Uh, any other opinions about how important Hebrew and Greek are? I mean, you know, some people seem to think with modern commentaries and concordances and internet and all the things we have today, is it really important for pastors to know Hebrew and Greek? Any thoughts about that from any of you? Um, I, I would say yes, absolutely, because it, it will add a richness and a depth uh, <laughs> to someone's ministry if they've got a grasp of the, uh, of the original languages. You just see things in the text when you can read them in the Greek and the Hebrew that you, you would just never see when you read it in translation. And if, if you're preparing someone for a lifetime of ministry, you know, the, the, the great the great danger, the great worry is, is, that, is that this brother is going to start preaching and five years down the road, he's just going to dry up, you know, um, and he needs to be constantly uh, digging deeper into the word. And I think I think your your Greek and Hebrew are great help with that. And also, um... I'm yet to meet someone who actually studied Greek and said it's useless. <laughs> you know, 
uh, once you do that and you see its importance when when you go into the text grasping the, the the message of the text you know connecting to your biblical theology so that you can preach better to your congregation uh, the moment you have that experience it's hard to go back and and especially in our context um our 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 professors or the people teaching here, they had the experience. They wanted to bring it back to Portugal. And most of the people that are saying that, in our context at least, uh, that it wasn't important. It's because they did not have the same training. training, hmm. And they did, not, they did not have that experience to read the text in its original language. It makes a whole lot of a difference for a pastor. Hmm. And yes, it's going to be a source of encouragement many times. When you have lacks of resources, at, for instance, in your own language, hmm. um, and it's really, really helpful. I right. think in our time it would be, oh, I would say essential, especially in our times, where in Europe people are more and more educated. Uh, the level of education of our pastors as well should excel. Yeah, great. Thank you. Clive, coming back to you. Uh, do you think there's a danger of pragmatism in the training of gospel workers today uh, at the expense maybe of a more traditional theological preparation? Is there a danger of going for the shorter and cheaper training options? What do you think about that? You're asking me easy questions there, aren't you? I think that <laughs> I think there probably is a danger of making preparation not sufficiently theological. Uh, a, an awful lot does go into making sure that the gospel someone holds out is is, is truly life-giving um, and rich and thoroughly scriptural. It takes time to do that. We, we, we need theological depth. I think at the same time, we probably do need to recognize the constraints people are facing in accessing good training. You know, there are geographical constraints sometimes, there are family commitments, there are financial challenges. So it's, it's important that theological training be flexible and accessible. I think um, local churches as well, such an important role to play in forming gospel ministers uh, and, and, you know, seminaries, schools of theology just just play a role in that alongside partnering. Um, so, yeah, it, th there needs to be good theological depth. Um, there needs to be a realism, I think, as well about the challenges that, that people are facing in different contexts. And those those challenges vary. Hmm. Great. Um, let's think a bit about, uh, we can call it maybe online training or maybe remote training, slightly different concepts, I think. But uh, Dig, if I can start with you on this subject, this area, um, am I right in thinking that the training at the Martin Buser Seminary in Portugal is a combination of in-person training and remote training? And if so, how does that work? What would you say, Diego, are the pros and cons of remote training? Well, um, let me put this way. Um, well, remote, remote in what perspective? Because sometimes in our context, if the students would be remotely or studying away from their local churches, that would be very hard because the very people that are committed to the work of the church would be leaving the church. And we cannot afford that in Portugal. So we thought about meeting those needs where we partner with the local church because the responsibility to train pastors is actually from the church. And we are just coming alongside as partners. And, and that's the reason we decided to have this hybrid uh, proposal for, for our seminary, which is we have online training, uh, or I wouldn't call it online training, remote training. And then we have intensive weeks uh, ev every semester as well. So we have training from morning to evening at least once a semester and sometimes twice uh, because we also have workshops for expository preaching. And um, and that's that's the reality. We, we want to have a platform where students can come together, know each other, have fellowship, but also a place where they can study together. And they do a lot of teaching online. You know, we do a lot of teaching and meetings like this on, uh, on Zoom. And then we meet at least once a semester. The pros are that they can study theology and also be very involved in the local church. And that, I think that's the biggest pro. 
and the cones is well i wouldn't say much but every time we get together we feel like we need more <laughs> so you know but it's it's a bittersweet experience here because uh there is always that need to have more fellowship but also we have that space to create networks to create support for each other and that develops as well as they go back to the local church uh, the students go back to the local churches and uh, I would say a con is always that we feel like we need more. However, every time we think about the local church and the way we partner with the local churches for training, uh, it's always it's always a blessing. So we come alongside the local church with this hybrid model, and it's been very helpful. Bill, can you tell us how it works at London Seminary in terms of you know students? who are there in person and others who are not there in person. How does that work? OK, so so all of our lectures, all of our training is on a hybrid model. So the emphasis is very much on training in person. Um, in fact, as far as we're concerned, the, the gold standard is residential training because there's, there's nothing like having the students living together residentially, interacting with one another. There's that sense of being a band of brothers, iron sharpening iron. It's a terrific environment um and if, if they can't be residential then uh, you know if they if they can travel in and spend perhaps a couple of couple of nights a week something like that but but then inevitably not all students can do that so i, I see that our brother joao is on the call and he trained at london seminary and almost all of his training was on zoom because um uh, he's based in portugal um and so he couldn't get over to the seminary very much um, and Zoom works. So um, that's sort of what we what we call synchronous uh, uh, remote training. Uh, but it isn't nearly as good as in person. So when so when our brother Joao had the opportunity to come over from Portugal and be at the seminary in person, um, he, he discovered it to be just a completely different experience. It's a much better experience to be in the room, engaging with the lecturer, engaging with the other students, having the informal questions, conversations over coffee, over lunch break. Yeah, it, it, do, it does make a big, big difference. Hmm. Right. Let's think a bit about maybe postgraduate studies. Um, uh, Pal, uh, you, for example, I know that you've done uh, postgraduate studies uh, and what would you say is the value of that? I mean, you're a pastor, but you're also a lecturer. You're involved at the seminary there in Oravia in Romania. Um, so you've done postgraduate studies. But would you say there's a particular kind of ministry that could especially benefit from postgraduate studies, pal? Certainly, any study repays. So uh, it's, it's good to study. Uh, regarding postgraduate studies, uh, in the case if if it is particularly needed, so for example, if one can be involved in a uh, lecturing uh, ministry in a seminary which is accredited, let's say, then that would be useful, hmm. uh, even even needed. So uh, sometimes it gives credibility both to the students and to other seminaries. Uh, to have a degree, I don't think it is particularly or necessarily uh, it's a, it's a must uh, if we train for for a for the pastoral ministry. Um, I am very much for an all round ministry, as Persian said, because sometimes if one gets a degree, a postgraduate degree, can can dig down in a narrow way into a subject, but can be useless in an overall way. Hmm. So it is. it has to be, depends also if they have finance uh, to do it, or if they have the time, or if the church allows that. Um, in my case, it was, uh, it was uh, sought and advised to do it. I have done it. Uh, so yes, it uh, it also depends if if the if the st students want to get a degree which is useful to them somewhere else, not just for uh, the pastors in their in their ministry, but we train uh, uh, teachers of Christianity in our uh, public schools. So they need a degree 
and uh, and in that case that is very use useful so mm -hmm. it has to be approached in a in a very balanced way it depends i would say mm -hmm. it depends okay thank you um bill I, I think clive referred earlier to the close relationship between seminaries and bible college and local churches uh, but what about um training in the local church itself um shouldn't we be making more use of that in addition to more formal seminary type training how can we encourage bill a, a culture let's say of training in the churches okay well that that's a brilliant point about a culture of training in local churches because surely all of our local churches should have a culture of training uh, within them uh, mm -hmm. so um if you if you look at ephesians chapter 4 the whole the whole business of pastor teachers is to be I equipping the saints for ministry so we're always to be looking out as to how we can develop and encourage the gifts um, and ministries of those within our congregations um, and what training is there for, you know, the Sunday school teacher or the youth worker or are they just thrown in at the deep end? Uh, my women's worker, when I was a pastor, was brilliant at encouraging women and equipping them to grow and develop in skills and confidence to lead Bible studies and to read and pray and disciple other women. Are we equipping and training folks for their secular employment, the challenges they're facing uh, in terms of Christian faith um, there. And we should always be asking, where is the next generation of elders and deacons coming from? Giving responsibilities early on um, to young men, uh, giving instruction, encouragement to read good books, all of that it, it, experience of preaching, giving devotions. So, yes, that culture of training is 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 vital. And then we could say, well, why don't we just do seminary level training in the local church and make it all local church based the, the the problem with that is twofold one is that there's very few pastors with the skill set to be able to teach greek and hebrew and all the theological disciplines and practical disciplines uh, for ministry training and the second problem with that is 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 that there's a real advantage in stepping out of your local church setting um, to encounter others from different backgrounds um, so that you see different sorts of churches, different patterns of ministry. You learn to get along with folks with different convictions uh, to yourself than you've grown up with in your own local church. And that's a real learning and a character forming experience that makes you think. But it's not either or, it's both and. So, you know, it's the seminary working alongside and with the local church. The local church is always the heart of training and the seminary comes alongside to help and provide those other elements that might be advantageous and, and, and Bill what about um, things like placements church placements internships uh, what can, what part can they play in the training of workers yeah well it's it's just great if students can have experience of different sorts of churches and talk to a variety of pastors about their experience of pastoral ministry um, I rather mischievously enjoy sending students to churches which might be a bit outside their comfort zone so that they get an experience of something a bit different but I think especially when we're talking about European students it's great if they can for example visit the UK spend some time in in British churches which perhaps are uh, a bit bigger perhaps exercising different sorts of ministries and they can think about ministry in in different ways great Hmm. Great. So, uh, Clive, Bill just mentioned Europe. So that, that leads us neatly into the next question I have for you, which is, you know, thinking now about the whole of our continent rather than just, you know, the UK or whatever. Uh, but I know that, you know, Union uh, has these learning communities all over the world. And so from your experience and what you've seen of that, would you say that Europe is still too dependent on English language training? I mean, what what more could we be doing to encourage uh, the training in each of the local languages and not depend so much on English language training? Yeah, thank you. I mean, we're we're really grateful to be able to set up learning communities in 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 some countries in Europe. Um, for instance, just 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 recently we set one up in Poland, but it is dependent on a certain level of English proficiency on the part of the people who are training. Hmm. Um, Ideally, you'd, you'd want there to be a local seminary there. But of course, you know, that's not always the case. Um, things that can help if, if it's provision from the UK, things like translation of books, use of subtitles. If you're delivering the teaching on video, um, local mentors coming alongside and, and helping. So you've got a sort of bilingual setting. 
We're actually starting to do a little bit of that in Wales um, with um, use of the Welsh language as well. So, yeah, it is a challenge. And, and you get the impression that uh, more provision in languages other than English really would help in, par in parts of Europe. Hmm. Do you have thoughts on that, Diego? Well, in my context in Portugal, we think that it's very important for our students to speak English. Uh, we, we feel isolated sometimes in Europe uh, because of our language. So in order to have a language that will be common to everybody so that European countries could help each other, it's adamant that we learn a language that's going to be a bridge so that we all can communicate and contribute. Uh, even now, we, we're having more uh, partnerships with our Spanish brothers. And although people think we understand each other, every time we get together, we speak English. <laughs> so it's very important uh, that... The, the seminary you have that understand that missionary understanding as well, uh, and I students will benefit from that as well. So I think yeah, it is important to have material in our own language, but it's also important that our students students speak English. Great. In Thanks, uh, Paul. Coming back to you for a final question. Uh, there's so much more that we could obviously ask and think about in this vast important subject of training, but. Uh, Pal, we've got a lot of people with us this evening who, you know, belong to churches, maybe some of them are church leaders, uh, just members of their churches. Uh, how how would you say that people like the people on this call this evening uh, on this webinar and churches, the churches that they represent, uh, what more could they do to support training, uh, the training of gospel workers in Europe? How would you encourage uh, the people that are with us this evening to get more involved in in supporting training in different ways? In one sense, uh, they could do it, of course, financially. As in our churches, we support uh, our seminary, each each church. Another, in another way, um, everybody could look around and to see if they can encourage somebody in the church to study further. Maybe there is a young man who uh, who could be encouraged, and uh, I would say that that would be very useful as well. Mm -hmm. Just to uh, pray whether the God, whether our Lord is calling him to the ministry or to pursue some studies in a in a in a certain way, uh, or to put it on a on a regular uh, prayer uh, list to pray for certain seminaries or training course and uh, to get to know students. Um, th those would be my thoughts. Great. I mean, I know it's obvious, but, you know, we say prayer because, you know, prayer is always right, isn't it? It's always the right thing to do. But as I think back over the prayer meetings I've attended over the years, uh, I can't remember many occasions when people were praying for seminaries and Bible colleges and training. So I, I certainly think that, you know, pastors and other church leaders could do more perhaps to encourage their congregations to uh, include, uh, you know, praying for training and for training uh, courses and training institutions uh, in the church prayer meeting and so on. I think more, more could and should be done probably in that respect, you know, just to get people not forgetting uh, how important training is what you know how, however we go about that training but to pray more and to pray that you know the lord will raise up more people and then they'll get the training they need and they'll become increasingly useful with that training so i think all of that could be incorporated more into you know regular church life in many of our local churches anyway uh we've come really to the end of our discussion time which has flown past at least from my point of view uh 30 or 30 35 minutes or so flies past very quickly but um can i just say that you know i really appreciate the time that uh, you brothers have put in well first of all for being willing to accept our invitation for this evening uh, but just for the time and the thought that you've given you know to, to the questions and I, I really think it is an important subject you know because i personally believe that uh we want to see new churches being planted everywhere but you can't have church planting without trained people to lead those church plants so i think those two things go definitely together training and church planting so you know training is so important if we want the gospel to be spreading 
not just all over Europe, but all over the world. So I think this has been really helpful, uh, you know, to guide us in our thinking about training as being important and so on. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have a, a Q&A time now. Um, I think there at least have been some questions coming in uh, during the course of the webinar so far. So what I'll do now is I'll hand over to Martin Tatham. Uh, he's the one that collates people's questions. Uh, Martin, have we got any questions? Uh, which question uh, have we got to start the ball rolling? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. We've got several questions. Then maybe I could just remind people as we go, just to, if you want to ask a question, um, let me just uh, share my screen again. The um, the process is to put a put your question on the chat. We've got several going there, but and then I'll try and collate those, and I'll see if I can keep pace with them. We've got questions coming in as we talk, so I'm trying to look at those coming in and then put them out to the panel. So you'll have to bear with me a bit. Um, but we've got several already. But maybe I could just ask. Um, uh, a general one about uh, I, I suppose it's it's to all of you including Andrew what do you see in maybe in the, in the last 10 years about the development of training in Europe um, uh, we still see many students coming to the UK for training and there's a basic question well why is that are we seeing more uh, good biblic biblically based training establishments in Europe and Andrew, please, yeah, please feel free to answer that yourself because I think you have a good, as good a view as any of that for those. I mean, certainly, I've seen over the last ten years uh, a number of new seminaries starting up in different European countries, and that's been really encouraging because not that long ago uh, there weren't many good seminaries in a number of European countries, and I think now there are more than there were. And the Martin Buser in Portugal is an example of that, uh, and I think there are others too in other European countries still got a long way to go i mean i think some people um this this ties up with what somebody was diego was saying about the need to learn english i think that uh although we may want there to be seminaries in the languages of all the countries but at the same time we see the value of people learning english because just by learning english they're going to be able to read more christian books have access to so much that they don't have access to in their own language so i think it's a balance really i think i mean i would love to see you know, seminars springing up in every European country, you know, with the language of that country. But at the same time, uh, I see the value of all students uh, learning English for all sorts of other benefits that they get from that as well, you know. And I think that's going to be a reality in the European Union more and more, because here we have neighbours that are Polish, we have neighbours that come from all over Europe, we have neighbours, we have immigrants as well. Uh, and because that's our reality in some instance if you want to minister to the people that are actually in our neighborhoods um we cannot speak only our language because that's not our reality anymore so we need a bridge uh, we need to bridge that gap you know also speaking english that would have would be very helpful especially in lisbon i would say uh, today it's very important uh, to communicate to people in in lisbon 2023 or almost 24 uh, it's very important. We just have to speak English everywhere. So it's a necessity for the ministry right now. Uh, and in, in, yeah, it, it's very helpful as well in terms of resources and especially networking because European countries need each other for training. So mm -hmm. that's that's very important as well. Thanks. Um, we've got a couple of questions about selection of students. Uh, for training um, and maybe I can combine two questions one from Andy and Jean Woods about how do you select students and avoid simply filling vacancies um, but I, I suppose also link with that and then Sam Brinkley asks us to say what, what's the processes in place uh, between the training establishment and the home church to make sure that a prospective student has been called by God and has the support of a home church uh, maybe Bill, could I come to you on that one first? Yeah, so um, all seminaries are under pressure in terms of wanting to recruit more students. All seminaries are losing money and wanting to attract more students for the fee income and so on, more and more support. So the great temptation is to open the doors wide and to welcome in as many students as possible. But it's that's fatal. It's It's just hopeless. Uh, it doesn't actually serve the seminary well in the long term if you're training men who, who are not called to ministry. It doesn't serve those men well and ultimately it doesn't serve the church as well. So you have to be pretty ruthless. And in terms of our selection, there's an application process, there's an interview. 
But then in addition to that, there are references from the, from, from the local church and perhaps from other senior leaders who, who know this candidate. And, and we rely very much on that. But, you know, I, I would love to see even more. I'm very interested that regularly at the seminary we have visit days. Only once, I think, have I ever known a prospective student come along to a visit day with his pastor. Um, and I, I just thought that was terrific. And um, that the pastor was taking such an active interest, both in the prospective student and in the prospective uh, training destination. And we can have conversations with both of them at the same time. And that's the sort of partnership that, that I, I, I really appreciate. Hmm. I, may I add something? Go ahead, Paul, yeah. Uh, in our case, our seminary is small, but to select students is very strict. Nobody can apply to come unless he's a uh, church member at least for three years and uh, and is involved in the church um, in different ways in the different in different ministries, youth group or or leading prayer meetings or uh, even preaching. But uh, nobody can apply to come to the seminary unless at least 75% of the church, of his local church, votes for it. Goodness. It's a high so bench <laughs> uh, we, we wouldn't accept anybody without such a, a recommendation letter. Hmm. And then other, a group of pastors or leaders would... Uh, ask him to share his testimony how he got saved what is his uh, what what is his thoughts regarding ministry and what what does he has a call and so on and at the end nobody would be ordained nowadays unless he finished well his course including mm -hmm. the dissertation as well <laughs> so that's that's very very uh, it's a part of the faithfulness that he has to show mm. in order to uh, go on to the pastoral ministry. Mm. Thanks, Paul. Sounds very thorough. Well, we... in a... Okay. Sorry, Diego. Go ahead. In our context, I would say I would I would say amen to everything that was shared, uh, but we also have to remember in our context that a lot of our candidates are already pastoring churches. So we have students that are already pastoring churches, and they feel they need training. Mm. So uh, they come to the seminary while they they are pastoring churches. Mm. And, and that's an interesting point. So, so the majority of your of your trainees, your students, are are all, are, are part time and, and already involved in pastoral ministry. Oh uh, yes, I have to check mm. exactly the numbers, but yeah, a, a good number of mm. them uh, are already pastoring churches. Thanks. I, I, I keep sort of get through as many questions because we've got some really interesting questions. We've got a couple which are both related, coming back to this topic about, about um, joining together communities of learning. One from Marion, and I'll, I'll, I'm not sure I quite understand the question exactly, but he says, what's the value of the community of the hermeneutic? I think he's quoting Don Carson. Um, why and how do pastors relate to each other in fraternals to equip each other uh, and uh, together and to group each other together to combat isolationism. And then maybe I could also add a similar one from Stephen Green about, um, about um, the value of living together in a community to progress holiness, relationships, and teamwork. Um, maybe Clive, could I come to you on that one about the, the value of coming of joining together in training? Yeah, surely. I think there's um, very great value in sort of peer-to-peer learning so in in the learning communities that we 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 set up at union um you know the students are teaching each other mm. as well as the word of christ dwells in them richly and so, so that sort of learning and formation <clears throat> excuse me in community is yeah extremely valuable bill do you want to add into that yeah, yeah, I, 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 I just think that community element makes all the difference, and particularly being exposed to other students who have different opinions to yourself, and and having having to sit next to someone who is Pentecostal if you're cessationist, 
or having to sit next to someone who is who is pre-millennial if you're post-millennial. It's extremely painful, but it's very formative and it's very helpful. And you just have to bash these things out and learn that you can still love love one another, even even though this other brother is clearly wrong because he disagrees with you. So so yes, <laughs> and then w within that community, those those lifelong friendships are, are formed, which hopefully will form a basis for 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 years to come, and also pointing towards fraternals and and so on and so forth. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Again, uh, moving on quickly to a very different topic. And again, this one comes from Marion, Marion Thomas. We're committed to a complementarian view of men and women in ministry, but what encouragement should be given to women to develop biblically and theologically? Um, Diego, maybe I could come to you on that. Well, uh, why the question is coming to me? <laughs> that just because you because I've I come to climb and Bill first, but I will come back to Bill because I'm keen to, to pick up about the about the uh, flourish course in in London. Yeah. Uh, we we affirm training for women because we believe that women should be discipling women, and for that it is necessary that they also have training. I think one of the things that we need to change in our complementary approach is, is sometimes, you know, because we are fighting uh, the struggle of, you know, being in a context where the roles of men and women are in question, our tendency is to push the training of women aside, but it's not good for the local church. It's not good for the church. It's not good for, for women who are also called to train each other and also called to teach each other. Uh, so, uh, we firmly believe in that. Uh, we do. Although our seminary is focused on training pastors, mm -hmm. we also do uh, and we support women that are also training uh, mm -hmm. for that, specifically for that reason, mm -hmm. to disciple other women. So Maybe. we have we have about two students in our seminary that, that come from our churches as well that develop uh, women's ministries and they are studying with us. I would like to have more in the future, of course, but our focus is for pastors right now, and we have we have limited resources. So we cannot accept all the candidates that apply, but uh, we we believe in that, and we are in some way trying to support uh, theological training for women. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say as well at home, you know, my wife is very connected to training other women all over the other women ministries all over the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, in other places as well outside of Portugal. So in our local church, in our seminary, we do believe as complementarians that mm. we should be trained to develop their own ministry amongst women. Clive and Bill, maybe you, do you want to add, add anything to that? I know, I know a lot of people, people have spoken very highly of the Flourish course. Uh, Clive, I'm not sure about, about Union, but what, what course is there? But anyway, please feel free to add, add to what Diego said. Yeah, I'd, 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 I'd just say amen. Yes, uh, yes, there is the Flourish course at London Seminary. It's a sort of two-year course, uh, one day a month, um, for women ministering to women. It includes ele elements of doctrine, biblical studies, ethics, and and areas of, of practical uh, ministry for women ministering to women. But, but you know, my experience of training for ministry, when I, I took my master's degree, was that my wife was training for the same degree alongside me. And and, and there's very much a sense that that when when you're in pastoral ministry, your wife is alongside you. And if she's not 100 percent on board with the program about your convictions and about your approach to ministry and actually your goals and, and your aspirations in terms of how you're leading the church, then then you are completely lost. Um, so, you know, both both the man and the woman have to be taken very, very seriously. And, you know, we have a seminary wives program and, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, our men as well. We have a, a Priscilla course at Union, which helps to introduce women to theology. But about a quarter of our, our students are female um, are on the, the formal degree programs mm -hmm. and are training for all sorts of different kinds of ministry as well. So, yeah, really important. Hmm. Well, I think we're going to run out of time with all the questions, but maybe I could just finish with one. Um, maybe I could direct this to Pal at least initially. And, and it comes from Malcolm and Jean McGregor. Um, uh, Pal, you mentioned looking out for younger men with potential. What about older men who have already proven in in the church, who may be retired or approaching retirement, maybe have more time if their children have moved away, but be given could give more time to ministry? What about the training of old, older men? 
in the case of specimen. older men uh, who feel or a sense of call to the ministry, they they would be uh, ordained uh, on the basis of that call and the recommendation of the church or the vote of the church, even without theological training. But after that, we would recommend to pursue some kind of loose training that would fit his own pace. So, um, yes, we do make a difference. And the older ones are, it's open and it's possible to uh, get into the ministry or even to train or to study. We have smaller Bible schools as well, weekend Bible schools, where people who are uh, free on Saturday, they have a day off, they can attend the schools. And um, that is useful as well. Uh, thanks very much, brothers. I, I think I, uh, we've got a few more questions. We'll take that to the, the follow-up session for those who want to stay. But maybe I can hand back to Ali now um, to, to bring the session to a close. Thanks, Ali. Sorry about that. I couldn't get Sorry, my, my apologies. My fault. <laughs> That's all right. Um, well, yes, thank you, Martin. Thank you um, on everyone's behalf, Bill, Clive, Diego and Pal, and of course, Andrew. We've really loved listening to your ideas and your thoughts on training. And I think it's been really helpful to consider um, some of the options and the challenges. And I think I can safely say that you've given us plenty to think about and to be encouraged about. Um, and as Andrew mentioned, to pray. Uh, more fully for so thank you so much for your time and your input before we finish this part of our webinar um, i just want to give some announcements and some updates on what's been going on in emf uh, since our last webinar and hopefully you're going to see some slides and um, the first one that we want to talk about is our new gospel workers uh, we have, as you may already been aware, this has been a bit of a bumper year for new workers in EMF um, and we've been really delighted to have taken on nine new missionaries or missionary couples. You'll know some of the earlier ones from earlier in the year. So for now, just to focus on the most recent, the three at the bottom of the slide, we have Eilis and Mana in Finland, which is a new country for us, which is wonderful. We have Joao and Anna. Um, in north central Portugal. Now, some of you may remember Joao as, as one of our previous EMF training fund students, and Bill mentioned him earlier, so that ties in quite nicely with tonight's theme. And we have Andrea and Ruthie Festa in Italy. Now, these three couples are already engaged in gospel work in their countries, but it's a real joy to welcome them into the EMF family. Um, they've all just joined in the last month or so, so we will be sharing, and we look forward to sharing more about them with you in the coming months. Then we're going to move on to our Ukraine appeal. We are so grateful to, um, to you, our supporters, for your incredible and ongoing support of the work in Ukraine since, specifically since the war began. Um, we've been able to raise upwards of 1.88 million so far, uh, including over 50,000 just since September, since we launched our most recent appeal. And that work keeps on going. We're currently supporting 12 evangelical churches and organizations, and we are grateful to be able to keep doing that through this winter as things stand currently, but the needs are great. So the Ukraine fund remains, Ukraine fund remains open, and we really appreciate your help in enabling us to keep supporting these people and their works. Uh, moving on, we will also have a special announcement in February Sorry, Martin. We'll have a special announcement in February concerning the work of EMF in Ukraine. So do keep your eyes peeled for that. And if you'd like any more information on anything that's going on in Ukraine, do just get in touch with us. And we will also be sending out a newsletter about Ukraine in the next few weeks. If you don't already get that and would like to, just do let us know. Then moving on to ways to engage with us, we have a whole range of resources which we would love to share with you to help you learn more about the needs and opportunities for gospel work in Europe and to guide your prayers for our work. 
Um, and we'd also be delighted to come and visit and share with your church in person or online. So do get in touch if you'd like to request any more information or chat with us about anything at all. There are some details there on the screen to allow you to do that. And then finally, some details on our next webinar. So as you're probably aware by now, we have some big changes coming up in 2024 when Andrew takes a sideways move into the role of field director along with Vivian, his wife. To allow for this to happen, Scott Moore will be joining EMF as the new director. So in our next webinar, we'll be interviewing both Scott and his wife, Lorna, and the Birches and finding out more about them, about their new roles and about what lies ahead for EMF. So why not pop the date in your diary now? It'll be on the 5th of February, Monday, the 5th of February at 7.30 p.m. as usual. Now, if you need to leave us, you can do so in a moment, but we do tonight have an additional breakout session which will last for an extra 30 minutes. It's a further opportunity to interact with the panel and also to spend a short time in prayer together. And we would love you to join that. But for now, I'm just gonna draw this part of our meeting to a close in prayer. Let's just pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this evening. We thank you for Bill, Clive, Diego and Pal and for their contributions and the time that they've given us this evening. And we, we thank you for what we've learned and what we've considered. Father, we thank you for the work that you're doing through these seminaries and Bible colleges and many others to train and grow new workers for your harvest field. And Lord, we ask for your blessing and leading on those who are currently studying in these places and as they look to the future. And we ask for your blessing and leading on those who will teach them and guide them. Thank you for this time together. Watch over those who have to leave us now. And Lord, just continue to work in all of our hearts and lives. May we follow wholeheartedly after you. And we pray that you will use us as you build your church across our continent and across our world. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 So if you if you need to leave now, then thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we hope that you find this um, to be really encouraging and we hope that you'll join us the next time. So feel free to disconnect now. If you would like to stay on for the extra 30 minutes, then just stay where you are. And once everything has settled, Martin will get us off and going again. Thank you.